fácil es hacer son el doctor que se lo te enseña con sabor quesos colombianos y venezolanos todo hecho en tu casa con sabor zuliano y calor humano los quesos en casa tienen vitaminas rápidos de hacer en cualquier cocina Tan fácil como pelar mandarinas Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor A lo que es su hermano También que opera Costeño en matera, paipo, palmisuria Y hasta doble crema Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor Hi everyone, welcome to my show once again And, and to my, my channel TV uh, This is my English version of the program Ask the Cheese Doctor And this is for people who only speak English And a lot of followers on that. Most of them, or a lot of them, speak English from Africa, from Europe, and UK, and well, Australia as well. So, if you want to learn how to make cheese, you don't speak Spanish, you will be able to how to make cheese. Okay. And we are almost 16,000. Subscribers, we are 15,350. And I'm making the announcement with my iPad. <laughs> so, um, as you might know, I am developing a cheese course for beginners, and it's almost ready. If you want to learn how to make cheese, these are a series of videos. And um, these videos are going to be in Spanish because Spanish is my first language, but it will translate it to English, Chinese, Hindi. Okay, so if, so if you guys speak this type of languages, you can learn. Cheese. And if you follow my course, for sure you will be able to learn how to make cheese. Because in addition, uh, as added value for the course, you will, be, you will be in a Facebook group only for the University of Cheese, which is the group that I've developed. And um, we can interact over there, ask questions and, and stuff. So in The, the theoric part, the theoretical part is already finished. Only one video left, I'm going to finish it. And um, the rest of the, of the videos is the 15 cheeses. I only have 15 videos left, which are 15 cheeses that you're going to make into the course. When you finish the course, you will be making 15 cheeses, and you will have the knowledge to carry on this is for yourself. Um, the idea is that... <coughs> When you study the course first, you have to first go and, and watch the videos. Don't go directly to the recipes because if something happens, if for example, your milk don't coagulate, doesn't, doesn't coagulate, you will know because you saw the other videos or the first videos that with what's happening to the into your milk. So the idea is to carry on, do it step by step, and read the and watch the videos. Then when you finish the video, carry on with the with the recipes and start with the cheeses. Okay, we're gonna make 50 cheeses, fresh cheeses. We're gonna do pasta, filet cheese, mozzarella. Uh, we're gonna do roquefort, uh, parmesan, and anyway, a lot of a lot of cheeses. Okay. Um, <coughs> Ahmed said here that it doesn't sound clear. Well, uh, my computer is a little bit slow, so right. Uh, Ahmed, thanks for coming. And I will try to, um, let's see, it's not, it's not my fault, but the platform is it's rubbish. So, uh, it's not, it's not rubbish, it's, the, it's my computer, problem is with my computer. And um, if you have the, my cheese, my milk curdling, I'm making provolone, and then soon you're going to have a, a video how to make provolone, and I'm going to make another video uh, soon how to make Sardo cheese. Sardo cheese is from Argentina. So you guys want to learn how to make it. It's very easy to make. But um, the provolone is an Italian cheese. It's very good. Equal flavor. I'm going to uh, show you how to make it. And then uh, uh, you need to age it for three months. Even more if you want to. 
and then we're going to do the tasting. Okay. And thank you very much for a new member, Jose Rene Martinez. He's from Venezuela in the support category. Uh, today we're going to speak about when we make cheese. Sometimes we notice that especially when we make mozzarella, our cheeses become slimy, and it has a reason. And I'm going to teach you to tell you why is the reason for that. So I'm going to um, um, tell you what happens into the cheese, how to avoid it, uh, and especially when we put it in brine or when, when we put the cheese into the brine, we get this effect. It's gone slimy and it's not very, um, it's disgusting because it's slippery, the cheese, the, the, the curd is slippery, and sometimes it's sticky. So it's not very good and it also have a good, a good looking. So the idea is to have, how to avoid that. Okay. And I'm going to show you. Okay. And um, thank you for, uh, if you're still on the, um, the product, please let me know if you are, if you can listen correctly. And so I have the feedback that you improve every day. And you're invited every week at this time. We have here, we have 11 30 in New Zealand time today, Saturday. In America and the rest of the planet, it's Friday, okay? Friday night, Friday afternoon, depending on the, on the country. Okay, let's go with the presentation. I don't want all of us have things to do. And of course, at the end of, of the presentation, I'm going to answer the questions from my audience. And also, in, I'm also included in some Facebook groups that I also answer these questions over there, so we can have feedback and, and, and you can learn about the questions. The questions you can learn as well, what's happening uh, maybe you can have um, you may have any problem making the cheese, and because I answer this question, this case may might happen to you in the future. So the idea is to do something every day. Let's all, let me share the screen and let's go with the presentation. As I said today, we're Okay. Okay. Why do cheese is climbing? Let me turn on the presentation last in the last program. The here we are. This is my program. Okay. Why do cheese become slimy? When we are making cheese and we put it into the brine. Sometimes into the brine, the cheese become, as I said, slimy, slippery. And it, it's like rotten on the outside, on the rain, on the rind. So there is a reason for that. And I'm going to tell you what happened. So why do cheeses become slimy? Okay. It happens when, um, as you know, cheeses have a big percentage of the cheese is protein, casein, mainly. Okay. So. When we, when we soak the cheese into the brine, sometimes the brine is, is a little bit weak. And there is, um, when we put it into the brine, there is a, a, an osmosis, you know, um, an osmosis effect, which, um, because the brine has a bigger concentration and the cheese has a lower concentration. So there is, um, because we have these two types of concentration, um, in theory, um, we have, um, we have um, the both both environments need to equilibrate to equalize. So the idea is, and, and so when this happens, the protein of the of the of the cheese, the casein on the the outer the outer um, the outer part of the of the of the cheese becomes um, too hydrated, and because it's absorbed too much water because of this osmosis effect, okay? So when this happens, it's because we, uh, we have this protein hydration, okay? And it happens uh, that at a depth more or less three or four millimeters from the rind to the inside, okay? And this problem is called rotten rind or soft rind. People also call it um, slime rind. Okay, because the cheese becomes slime. Okay, um, this effect depends mainly on the hydration. 
it's, a, it's an hydration problem. The, 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 the cheese is too hydrated. So it depends on the cheese type. Um, especially when we make mozzarella, for example, and these mozzarella are not very, are not dry enough, and they have too much water, by putting, by putting it into the water as well, it will be too much hydration for the casein fibers and the cheese will become fine. Also, it happens in other cheeses um, that have low calcium level, okay, and high humidity. Um, if we make a fresh cheese, for example, and he, and, the, and, the, and 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 we way off too early, the cheese still has a lot of water or a lot of whey inside, and there is not much cyanuresis acting on it on the cheese. Um, if you know cyanuresis is when the cheese expels away, and and it's a natural process from the cheese. Um, if we don't allow the the cyanuresis, the cyanuresis to act, the cheese will become too humid. Therefore, we will not have this problem. Okay. Also, when we have the cheese, when we're using molds like penicillin camemberti, okay, and the mold and st start to liquefy the cheese from the outside to the inside, and we can have this sticky cheese because of the mold. And also, when we use uh, um, materials that um, age the cheeses. But they eat from the outside to the inside. There is a red bacteria, it's, it's called Brevibacterium linens, which is used in several types of cheeses, like Monster, for example. Also, when we make a, um, no, Havarti, no. Um, well, I don't have it in mind now, but for sure, the Monster cheese, we use that. We use this Brevibacterium linens, and it produces this effect. I mean, the, um, we make, uh, it produces this hydration on the cheese. Okay, the symptoms very very easy. The cheese becomes slimy and sticky. Um, sometimes when we are aging the cheeses and we put it into the um, aging uh, into the ripening box, sometimes we uh, we have too much moisture into the into the box, and therefore the rind of the cheese becomes sticky. And there is a question that someone ask me uh, or i have it over there in the to answer it why the cheese is sticky how to avoid that in this case because this is the ripening box by opening it a little bit and allow the air to enter because they just close the the, the, the people that is ripening the cheese in the right they close the ripening box hermetically which is not good we have to allow the air to go to, to go to, so the, the cheese can breathe Remember, the cheese is a live organism, so we need to allow them to breathe. Um, so, um, this, but this, but anyway, this is the system, the, the symptom. The cheese becomes slimy or sticky on the rind. And sometimes when we, when we are ripening cheeses with mold, or when we are using mold, the mold starts to peel off from the grill. Remember, when we, are, when we are aging camembert, for example, we put it over a grill. Sometimes, because of this hydration, the mold peels off the grill. And the, um, the attack of the mold it, for the, uh, on the cheese is not going to be even. So we're gonna, because part of the mold is, is attached to them, or it's attached to them, to the grill. So this is because the cheese is too hydrated. Okay? okay. And all, other factors that um, because this effect of hydration or this hydration effect is because our brine is too weak. When I when I say that the brine is too weak, is that the brine has a lower concentration value, less than 18 percent. When normal brine should be between eighteen or twenty three percent concentration, salt concentration. When we are below these levels. I mean, uh, when, I, when we are below 18, they, we say that the brine is weak and we're going to get this effect. Out. Anything that we put over there um, will, uh, cause, will make our, our cheese slimy. I'm going to tell you the, um, the, um, what happens into the cheese chemically, but later on in the, in the couple of minutes, so you will know. Um, also, when we, um, 
the lack of calcium into the brain, um, this osmosis effect um, make the cheese slimy because we don't have calcium. So it's a good practice when we use brine, we have to put calcium chloride on it. The, the percentage, I'm going to tell you later on, how much percentage do you have to have into your brine so you can have, you, 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 don't, you, uh, you, don't, you don't get this slimy cheese. Okay? Also, another factor that um, influence our, our, this hydration is the pH. If, our, if the pH of our brine is not adjusted in approximately 5.0, our, um, our brine will make the cheese to hydrate the, uh, hydrate the cheese too much. So in this case, uh, we have to always uh, be, um, remember, the cheese of the, in, in summary, the cheese of the, uh, the, the, the pH of the brine should be more or less to the cheese to the pH of the cheese, okay? So the pH is, a, is, a, is an issue that the um, dishydration. And also, of course, the mix of all the, all, all the above ones, all the others. If you have, if we have low level ten and no, and no calcium chloride or no calcium into the, into, into the, into the cheese, or into the brine, sorry, we might, we might get this effect. We, we might get this, um, this hydration in our, and therefore, we're going to have um, the slime cheese. Okay. Now, from the chemical point of view, why does it happen? Remember, I told you at the beginning that we have an osmosis interchange over there, right? This, the brine has, um, in general terms, I'm going to give you a I'm not going to go so, so in details. In general terms, the concentration of the brine is higher than the concentration of your cheese. Therefore, there's gonna be, and and these pressures they need to be equal. It's a natural process. Osmosis is a natural process. Osmosis is the pass of the, is the pass of the liquid from one from one environment with higher concentration to the other environment with less concentration because they need they tend to 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 equal each other. They, they tend to to compensate each other. Okay, so. What happens when we put the cheese into the brine? The salt from the brine passes through the cheese. And the whey from the cheese passes to the brine. So, and what is whey? Whey is water. So, if, we put water, uh, if, if the cheese is absorbing the salt from the brine, it's getting dehydrated. By getting dehydrated, it will expel water, which means it will expel whey. It, it can lose about, I would say, twenty percent of the of the weight. No, two percent. Two percent of the weight will pass of the cheese will pass to the brine. Therefore, our brine will have more water, and due to that, the concentration of the brine will start to weaken. Okay, so in the uh, if we do it every day. We have to monitor our brine because we know that the, the water from the cheese is going to pass through the way, and then we have to um, adjust the level of salt eventually. Okay. Um, when we, when normally, the, the other factor is that also um, we have in our cheese, we have calcium, remember? And the calcium from the cheese. Pass to the whey, and the the calcium for the whey pass to the cheese. That's the reason why we we need to have the same level of of pH, which more or less will be the same level of calcium. Okay. So um, when we when we make the cheese, the migration, um, um, how, how how can I say? When we are using weak brines. We are using weak brines, okay, less than 80%. As I said, there's going to be a migration of calcium from the cheese to the brine. And this migration is more or less 45% of the remaining calcium of the cheese, okay? So this produced a solubilization. I mean, by osmosis, the calcium solubilizes 
and hydrated caffeine. So um, that's why we have. That's the reason we have to put calcium into our brain. So how to avoid it? As I said, we have to use brains between 18% and 25% salt concentration. If we use a, a lower concentration, we're going to have a, 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 a hydrated rind and therefore a slimy cheese. If we use higher concentration than 25, our cheese will look white. Okay? And because the, the, the too much salt will dehydrate the cheese. So we have to be in this balance. I always use 20%. How to prepare a 20% brine solution? Very easy. Let's say that I have this glass of water. Okay? First, I'm going to drink some. Let's say that I have this glass. Of course, first I have my glass empty. So what I do is I have my, balance, my, my scale and I weigh my glass without anything. So I just tear my balance, my scale. I tear it, I put it in zero. Then if I'm going to prepare 20% brine solution, what, I, what we have to do is 20% brine solution means 20 grams of salt in 100 milliliters of solution, of salt solution. Okay, it's not 20 grams of salt in 100 milliliters of water. No, it's 100 is 20 grams of salt within 100 milliliters of salt solution. How do we do, how do we achieve, how do we achieve that? Well, we have to do it, as, as I said, we have to tear our scale with a glass on it, put the 20 grams of salt into the glass, and then fill up with water until we reach the mark of 100 milliliters, okay? After that, we, we have to mix, dissolve the salt, and we have a 20% brine solution. If we're gonna make the numbers for bigger amount, we just need to go linear. If we're going to prepare, let's say one liter, instead of 20 grams, we use uh, 200 grams. 200 grams of salt, same process. Instead of filling up to 100 mil, we fill up to a liter. Boom, the salt, and we have one liter of 20% brine solution. If we want to make 10 liter, instead of 200 grams, we use two kilos, two kilos of salt, okay? And fill up the tank. In this case, we won't have a glass. We will have a tank, it's 10 liter. So we have to fill up onto the amount of 10 liter. When we reach the 10 liter, we already put the, 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 the salt and mix, and we're gonna have 10 liters of 20% brine solution. This is the way to, to, to prepare, okay? So, um, as I said, the brine should be between pH 5.0, or should be around 5.0. How do we achieve that? Well, we have to have a pH meter, mainly. When we make cheese, we all have to have, it's a good practice to have a pH meter. Otherwise, you won't have accurate values because you're, and you're gonna be working with your eyes blind or your eyes cover with a band or something like that because you um, you need to know the pH of the cheese. And as a matter of fact, when we are making cheese professionally, part of the of your system should be to measure pH and you have to report it. So it's a good practice to have a pH meter. So the brand should be of pH 5.0. If your pH if higher than pH, higher than 5.0, you have to acidify a little bit. You have to put maybe citric acid, you can put vinegar, any type of, sorry, any type of food graded acid, any type of food graded acid. So um, if, you, if your brine is too acid, you have to alkalinize a little bit. So you, have, you can put uh, sodium bicarbonate, which is food graded, food graded um, sodium bicarbonate, and to raise a little bit. And you have to start measuring pH and, and try to reach it at 5.0. Roughly, it doesn't have to be a sign. You can put, you can have 5.1, 5.5, depending on the accuracy of your pH meter. But no less than 5, okay? You can have 5.1, 5.2. Generally, the cheeses, especially the pasta filata cheeses, are between 
You are getting five, it's all right. Five to one, it's also all right. Okay, but no, no more than that. Around five. Also, your calcium, um, your calcium should be 0.5 percent. Okay, so you have to, um, me, um, if you see calcium, 0.5 percent is the same process. You have to prepare 0.5 percent solution of calcium. How do I, how do I say? Is how do you achieve that? Same process. Half a gram of calcium, 99.9 concentration in 100 milliliter milliliter of of solution. Same process. Okay. Also, um, another another way to avoid this slimy cheese because sometimes the cheeses um, become uh, become um, contaminated by external sources like uh, aerobic um, um, Streptococcus aureus, uh, maybe E. coli. E. coli is uh, H. coli. It's a coliform. Maybe if you have flies flying around you when you're making cheese, especially if you're making cheese at home, and you have flies floating or, uh, around, and maybe the flies, you have to just step on some kinds of fecal um, environment or whatever, and they will pass to your cheese or to your equipment. So you will have this, constant, uh, this, pro this problem. So by pasteurizing your brine, eventually, maybe once a week or or once every two weeks or fortnightly, you will have your 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 brine um, clean, sanitized. It's also a good practice to filter your brine because when you are when we when we put the cheeses into the brine, the cheese just they drop some kind of maybe salt, calcium, and um, um, calcium phosphate, and um, even pieces of cheese that go to the to the brine and deposit on the, on the bottom of the of the container. So it's a good practice to filter everything. So we can have all we all can have a, a clean um, brine. Okay. Also, the brine should have should be at uh, ten degrees Celsius, eleven degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, not very cold. The higher the temperature, the faster will be the absorption of salt into the from the brine. Okay. Um. Also, it's a good practice to use your brine frequently because if you use your brine frequently. Remember, the calcium will pass to the brine, the brine, the calcium of the brine will pass to the cheese. Same with the salt. And uh, if you use it frequently, there is going to be um, an intercate of calcium. And, 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 and the, the brine will, also, will always have the right level of calcium because it comes from the cheese. It tends to equalize to equal the, the pressures from both environments. And of course, it's, it's good practice to monitor the salt. Okay. Um, also, uh, when we uh, when we use when we use um, our brand frequently, remember that the cheese has lactic acid. So, if we use our brand very frequently, as I said, the calcium passes to the brand to the brand, and they tend to equalize. The same happens with the lactic acid. So if we have a pH of five point zero. But the lactic acid is passing to the cheese, okay, and the pH is more or less being the same, okay. So in general terms, when we are making cheese, the pH and um, calcium level should be the same as the cheese. So you see, we will have this problem, okay. That's it. This is about the, about the um, about the, the um, slime, uh, slimy cheeses, and let's go with the Q and A. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask. Anyway, Manal, be uh, welcome. Um, are you? Uh, Thank for coming in, Manal. And um, I answered all the questions from audience and the group through that I'm included as well. So let's go and. And you're saying here, I have a, you have a problem in your mic. Um, so, yeah. I have a problem on my, 
computer, the internet, because and the problem and I use the same mic. So it's problem with the internet, all right? And I'm having this problem, you know, if you are still listening correctly. Otherwise, I will have to do something about it. Please let me know if you have a problem. I'm going to get that. Okay, wait. The thing is, my computer is very limited. My computer is very limited. And um, uh, Let me share this one. My computer is very limited. You only have four gigabytes memory. And I had this the same problem last week, but it has only happened twice. I've been making sure with the same computer. I don't know what happened. I'm going to maintain the computer, something like that. Let's see. Um, okay, I will try to answer a question. If you have, if you are having, please comment, Manel. If you I'm not listening correctly, so I can do something about it for the next round. We maintain it to the computer, maybe, and let me know. So let's go and answer questions. If you guys have any questions, don't uh, you can ask me. Um, Sanet saying hi. I am making a Colby with mesophilic culture. Should I use type 11 or type B? Well, look. For Colby, if you are using, you can use the, uh, the recipe tells you type 11 mesophilic culture or type B, whatever, because when these people um, post the recipes, they want you to buy their product. This is mainly the reason. If you want to learn, uh, you can use any type of mesophilic culture. You can use um, stratocost. In lactobacillus lactis or cremoris, any type of it. Mesophilic culture is Streptococcus lactis, and strepto, sub, Streptococcus lactis sublactis is the name of the bacteria, or Streptococcus lactis subcremoris. Okay? Normally they come together. So um, you can use any type of it. And the amount to be used is the amount that the suppliers advise. Okay? You don't have to use. Three grams, whatever, whatever it says in the in the um, in your recipe. No, it doesn't work like that. It's according to the supplier's specification because they are the ones who did the who fabricated, who manufactured the product, and they always advise an amount. Of course, they advise an amount in between a range. The more well, you have to have an account is that the more culture that you put into your into your milk. Or and when you when you get curdled and you get the curd, the faster will be the acidification. So you have to manage this. Um, if you if you put too much culture, you're gonna have a fast acidification, and maybe depending on the cheese that you are making, you won't have the you will reach your pH level or your pH target too fast or too quickly. So you have to be careful. For example, um, when I was making provolone, the recipe stated for 0 0.26 grams per 15 liters of milk. When I use this this formula, my curd my curd acidified too quickly, and I didn't have time to um, to stretch the curd because provolone is a stretch mozzarella, but you have the only the only um, uh, difference is that you have to ripen it and use another uh, light and stuff, stuff like that. So, so the thing is that my acidification rate was too quickly, was too was too fast. So I reduced the amount of culture. The same happened with the mesophilic one. Use the amount advised by the supplier. That's it. And you can make any, you can use any type of mesophilic. Culture. Okay. Of course, if you want to give you the, your your copy, your personal touch, maybe you can put. Uh, uh, another, uh, another type of mesophilic culture, for example, flora, flora, uh, Floradanica, okay? Or you can, or you might use both mesophilic and thermophilic. It's your choice as a cheesemaker. 
is not that you have to use methophilic. Remember, when we make cheese, we're making art. And by making art, we can use the bacteria that we want. Okay? I may, sometimes I make mozzarella with mesophilic culture. And normally, the, the mozzarella is made with thermophilic culture. The point is that if I'm going to make mozzarella with, thermo, with methophilic culture, I have to use a lower temperature. That's the reason. That's it. Because mesophilic culture works at a lower temperature. Thermophilic works at a higher temperature. It depends. And this is what you need to, to, to have in account. If you're using mesophilic, you know that you have to heat your milk at a lower temperature. If you use the thermophilic, you have to heat your milk at a higher temperature. That's the thing. That's why you're here, to learn. Okay? And that's the reason you should take my course, because in my course, you will learn all this stuff. Let me see if we are... Um, Manal, Manal, um, do you are you correct? Please let me know. I would like to appreciate, I appreciate your feedback. You're asking here. Um, can I the cheese? Can I coat the cheese with butter, sugar, or cinnamon? Well, yes, you can. Remember, you're making art. Making cheese is making art. You can. If you want to, I mean, on the other side, you can top it with cinnamon and then with a little bit of sugar and, and butter. Um, the butter will protect the cheese from getting infected with mold. It's all right. And the sugar will give, give this contrast of sugar and salt, which is all right, because this is your cheese. And, and cinnamon give the special touch. Yeah, you can do that. Of course you can do that. And you're not going to believe it. I made a cheese once when I was studying king cheese. I made a cheese with chocolate. What I did, I put, I mixed the chocolate into the water, with water, uh, with, with the milk, and I make like a chocolate, chocolate milk. And then I cuddled the chocolate, or this chocolate milk. And I made it cheese. When you eat it, it tastes like chocolate. And I put some kind of um, fruits and stuff. It was very yum. It was a different cheese. I didn't make it anymore because um, my wife didn't like it. <laughs> but kind of type of cheese. I mean, you can do whatever you want with cheese. Because you are the cheese maker. And you are the one who are giving your personal touch. Maybe this cheese with butter, sugar, and lemon. Maybe you can you take it out of the stadium with this type of cheese and you can sell it. I mean, the imagination is the limit. Okay. And you said here, my butter, cinnamon together and call the cheese. Yeah. Put them all together. You can put it all together. It doesn't matter. And maybe you. A little, bit, a little bit of truffle on the top and the truffle or smoke it if you want you can put these three ingredients but in addition you can smoke the cheese and you will have another flavor so you can have four flavors in the cheese which is all right i made it i made um i'm going to compete in the international cheese award that's in, in, in october sorry in october. yeah late october mid october and I made a buffalo mozzarella. But I made it. Buffalo mozzarella is normal. Buffalo mozzarella. But I smoke it and put chili on it. I made it with chili. And it was really yum. And the smoke, flavor, contrast with the, with the milk of the mozzarella. Well, if I don't win, at least I made good cheese. So, as I said, you're the artisan, you're the artist. You can do whatever you want. Okay, let's go with another question. Um, it says here, Joseph, question. Should hard cheeses like Parm or Romano ever be cut using a wire type cheese cutter? I was told this was wrong. 
but I see it everywhere. So I'm wondering if there's any truth of what I've told. Look, Joseph, you can cut your cheese however you want. Matter of fact, when we are making Parmesan, when we are and when we are cutting Parmesan, Parmesan is a very hard cheese, very very hard, and, and it's a five kilo piece to cut with the wire. It's very hard to cut it with a wire, but if the wire is strong enough, you might cut it. But what do in Italy? They just start to pin in the cheese. This is the this is the bowl. Just they they, they stuck or they stuck literally a knife into the cheese. They in another and then in another in another part and all around the world and all around the cheese in the perimeter. There is a moment that when they stab the knife, the cheese will break, boom, into pieces. Like cutting marble, the same process. Because the Parmesan, especially Parmigiano Reggiano, is so hard that to cut, to cut it with the wood is very hard. Of course, if your Parmesan or your Romano is not so hard, you can cut it with a with wire. Doesn't matter. You can cut it with a knife. You can cut it with whatever the tool you want. Doesn't matter. It's not, there is no rule how to cut it. You cut it with the tool that you have available. There's not a special rule how to cut a cheese. Okay? Hard cheeses normally are cut with wire because they're hard. They're very, very hard to cut. But if, you, if your knife is very sharp, you can cut it with a sharp. It's not. Okay? For example, I made cheddar. Remember the video um, uh, of my cheddar cheese? This video cheddar cheese, I made um, this, and I cut it with my. I have a special knife that I bought in France for cheese cutting. So I bought I cut it with this, this is French. I mean, it's very fancy. So I cut it with this knife, and it cut perfectly. But I could have cut it as well with with a wire, or, or with a normal wire, or with a normal um, knife. It doesn't matter. As long as you have an effect, a clean cut, when you cut it, the cut is clean, so you don't get, you know, a, a scratch, it's all right. So um, when we cut cheeses, the idea is we have to have a clean cut. Very, I mean, that the, the, the face of the, of the cut is really, you can show the, the body of the cheese, okay? And it doesn't get loose when we cut it. That's the idea. Okay, let's go. Question. Ah, I don't have the name here. <clears throat> when I wash my Gouda curd, can I heat up regular tap water? Or does it need to be non chlorinated No, when you wash your when, when you are washing your, your, your curd to make Gouda, use tap water. Doesn't matter. I mean, um, the the um, when we use non culinary is for the rennet to act. When we, we use non culinary water, um, the, the, the even low levels of of, of 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 chlorine, for example, parts per million of chlorine, reduce the enzyme the rennet activity in forty percent. But it doesn't happen. It's not the same. It's not the same for the bacteria. So the when we are when you are um, weighing off, taking the weight off, because you have to wash your cord, and you take what you do is taking like totally normal water. The lactose that the bacteria needs is still there. we have lactose. But okay, you took fifty percent of the lactose, but you still have the other. 50% remaining, the other remaining 50%. So we still have lactose. And that's the reason, that's the reason we use, um, we use, we wash the curd to dissolve, to take a little, little bit of lactose and, and put normal water. The chlorine doesn't, we want because the, the, the level of chlorine of the tap water is very low. I don't know how much is it, but it's very low. Of course, if you're putting, if, you're, if your level of chlorine is 200 parts 
per million, let's say, this amount, it will affect. But the concentration of chlorine of the tap water, I reckon, is not even 2 per million. Yeah, yeah, 2 per million. It's a good price if you want um, the, level, the, the level of chlorine of your tap water. And if you know if how to do it, go to my website, doctorkesero.com, and I have over there stripes, paper stripes. You can put into your water and measure the level of chlorine solution. Okay? And then you can be your way. But low level of low level of chlorine doesn't affect the, the cheese. Okay. Okay, so the other question. Can milk be frozen and used later to make cheese? Well, I've never done it, but you can freeze goat milk and you can freeze uh, no for, for making pasta filetta cheese. I don't think so. Goat milk, I've heard that you can you can um, freeze it. But the, uh, for cow's milk, I don't think so, because uh, cow's milk, if you freeze it, the protein will be affected. And then when you are, when, when, when you um, um, make the cheese, you, your curd is going to be weak, so, because the protein will be affected. So I don't recommend it. I don't recommend that. For goat, I've heard that you can do it. Shannon, okay, Shannon says here, I have two gallons of unopened, non-homogenized, pasteurized farm fresh milk. Its best buy date was 9-3, which is, whew, okay. I couldn't get to making cheese till today. I don't know what it's today. Well, I reckon it's, Past the three nine day, should I attempt to dump the milk? It doesn't smell sour. Well, look, Shannon. If you have a bad milk, for sure you're gonna get a bad cheese, for sure. Um, that's why we need to when we make cheese, we have to use the milk as fresh as possible. But in this case, let's say that you have the you have. 300 liters of milk and that costs money. What you can do is maybe you can make if it doesn't, if, if the milk doesn't taste, check the pH of your milk. If the pH is around 6.4, 6.5, your milk is, is okay. But if the pH is 5 point something, forget about it. Dump it. Because it's acid. So, um, that's where we have to have a pH meter, see? So, um, if your pH is C1, maybe you might save it, but at 6.1, I don't recommend it because the milk is acidifying and you might have bacteria over there. You, for sure, you, you, you will have bacteria. And, and But it's, it's around 6.4, 6.5. Your milk is okay. You can carry on doing the cheese. But try to make a fresh cheese because you are in the limit. You're on the limit of, of the expiry date or a little bit further. But um, if you're going to make cheese, don't make provolone, for example, that you have to ripen. Or don't make um, Havarti or Gouda. Make a fresh cheese that you're going to consume in two or three more days. That's it. In this way, you will be protected. That's my opinion. Guy, Guy Nap, this this uh, this question has from my Facebook groups. It is possible to make something like camembert with no ripening cultures, just small cultures. In example, set milk with no bacteria involved from drained salt. Uh, sorry, no bacteria involved, form, drain, salt, etc., and inoculate with white mold. Would it still look, look liquefied or would it spoil because the pH wasn't low enough? 
or what? Are there, are there any fresh mold ripe in cheeses like this? You're right. If there is no acid, there won't be any mold development. Okay? I'm going to explain you. If you're making camembert, let's say, no lactic culture, okay? To make camembert, we have to have a lactic culture because the lactic culture will feed from the lactose and produce lactic acid. This is the normal process. And the, and the mold will proteolize the cheese, okay? But let's say that you don't have the lactic culture. What happens? The, for the mold to develop, they need to have lactic acid. They need to have any type of acid. Because the, the mold feeds from the lactic acid and produce a gradient, um, a pH gradient into the cheese. And the, um, there's going to be an a change of pH within the cheese. How? The mold will get food from the lactic acid. And he will produce subproducts, whatever. This subproduct will increase the pH. And the attack will be from the outside to the inside. Okay? But the mold to develop, they need two things. Moisture and food. The food is lactic acid. If we don't have lactic acid because we didn't, you didn't put cultures on it, you still might get the same effect. If you put acid chemically into your curd, you might put, let's say, vinegar, a little bit of vinegar, a little bit of citric acid, lactic acid artificially. You can buy lactic acid and put it into the mold, into, the, into, in, into, your, into your milk, and you will have the same effect. The point is that the lactic cultures, beside producing acid, they also produce enzymes that will help the cheese to proteolize and lipolize. So if you don't have these enzymes, you'll, the flavor of your cheese will become very soft, very bland, you know, not much flavor into your cheese. And the proteolysis, maybe the proteolysis will be, um, proteolysis, I don't know. Because protol uh, the cheese, you don't have enzymes. The, 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 the bacteria hasn't produced any enzyme because you, you didn't have any bacteria. So you won't have this enzyme that, that will help the cheese to proteolize. So um, therefore, the flavor of your cheese will not be the same and you will have a rubbish camembert. That's my opinion. Okay? So um, why do you have to invent the wheel if the wheel is already invented? So to make camembert, use the lactic bacteria because you will have a quality product. The, the, cult, the cultures will give the, bacteria, will give the cheese the flavor and the, en the enzymes that, that will give the cheese the flavor and aroma and the texture. So um, I would say you can do it if you want, but you, you will have a, a mediocre product, okay? Because you're acidifying chemically, you, will, you won't have the same flavor. I hope I have answered your question, Guy. Okay, another question for Shannon. Uh, can milk be frozen and used later to make it? I already answered this question. Yeah. Um, another question here, but yeah, I don't have the, the name. I have, a, I have a humidity monitor, and it shows an average of 65-70%. Is it good for cheese making? Uh, look, if your humidity level is below 70%, okay, your cheese, or, or 70%, your cheese will be dry um, and it might crack. You get, um, it won't ripen correctly. We have to ripen a cheese, we have to have at least 80%, 80% um, moisture. Relative humidity. We have to have 80% relative humidity. Depending on the type of cheese that you are making, you need a higher percentage of moisture. For example, if you are making camembert, you need 85% humidity. 
Okay? If you are making Roquefort, I reckon you need 90% humidity. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure. It's in the recipe. Each, this, ele, this element, I mean, these values, they are in the recipe and you need to respect it. Okay? Because um, if, you, if your level of moisture is too high, the mold will not develop maybe properly or accordingly. Or if, the, if your moisture is too low, the mold won't grow. Or maybe if it is too high, it will grow too much and it will liquefy your cheese too much. So um, you have to have in the, in the right bandwidth. How do I achieve that? You have to have an hygrometer. Hygrometer is a small, it's a small, it's a small uh, instrument, and they come from one dollar to two hundred dollars, or maybe more. Um, so the idea is to measure the the moisture. How do you achieve? But let's say we are making cheese from home, and so well, you, you can buy this um, this hygrometer. I, I'm gonna have on my website. But anyway, um, how do you achieve 80% if you don't have an hygrometer? Very easy. Put your cheese in your ripening box and put a small cup of water and cover the, cover the, um, the container, okay? And the, the water will evaporate into the, into, your, into the container. And you will have there more or less by putting a cup, a coffee cup, you have more or less, or a glass, or a glass of water. If your container is high, high enough, you can put a glass of water into this container, and you will have more or less 80%. If you want to increase at 90%, instead of putting a cup or a glass, put a plate. If you put a plate, um, the area of the evaporation area will be higher, and, then, and, then, and therefore, um, your moisture will be increased. In your, if you put a glass, the evaporation area or the exposure area of the of the water to evaporate is only this area. Okay, it will evaporate. But if you put a, a, a plate, the exposure area to evaporate it will be bigger. Therefore, your moisture level will increase. Will be increased. Okay, that's the, how you do it roughly, homemade. Okay, let's go. How are we time? Ooh, three minutes. Lucky. Okay, I have another question. Let me see, my now. Do you have another question? Let me see. I can read. I don't know why. Can I call you? Okay. Which the cheese can we coat in? You can coat any type of cheese, Manuel. You can coat any type of cheese. If you are making cheese, you you can you can coat any cheese. You can, for example, if you're making cheddar, you can make you can coat cheddar, and will you you will give your cheddar your personal touch. Um, you can um, look if you make a cheese, oh, fresh cheese, let it dry for one week, turn it over every week so it gets dry only. When the cheese is dry, okay, rub it with this mix of coat, uh, with this mix of um, salt, uh, sorry, sugar, you know, and the other, the other stuff, I don't remember what it is. And butter. Okay. Just rub it and the cheese will absorb all the stuff. And that's it. And then leave it for a while, turn it over every day, and then vacuum pack it. You can leave it maybe for two more two weeks. In two weeks, the cheese might develop some kind of mold, doesn't matter. Take it up. This, it's gonna be a touch butter. If you can, if you want to carry on rubbing it with 
more cinnamon or more salt, more sugar. It's your, it's your choice, it doesn't matter. And um, once after two weeks, three weeks, you can choose the time. It doesn't matter. You can vacuum pack and put it into the fridge for maybe two months, two or three months. And then give it a try. That might be one way to ripen this type of cheese. And then you can name it banana cheese. <laughs> okay. Ernesto. Hola. Hi, Ernesto. This is the program. You're, if you want, you are free to interact with us, but you have to do it in English. Because this, this program is for English speakers. My program. My next program is at uh, 10 a.m. New Zealand, which is in America, will be six, uh, 6 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? And it's Friday. Here we have Saturday. We are, we are in Saturday. Um, but you're more than welcome to attend. Matter. And if you want to learn, you can also take my my course, go to my channel. I have a lot of videos over there on my website, or Zero. And you will learn a lot. Okay, I have a lot of content. Welcome to my, my show. Manal, uh, good vibes. Thank you, Manal. Okay, um, we're done. The time passed, always passed. Um, time for coming, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I noticed that there's more people interacting, more people at the beginning, because it's an English program. Um, and my audience is mostly Spanish. More English speakers are added to the audience, and I really appreciate it. Uh, we are, as I said, almost 16,000 subscribers. If you know people, if you know your friends that want to learn how to make cheese or want to learn how to cook with cheese, because I'm having a session to cook with the cheese doctor. Um, I'm going to prepare recipes how to relate it to cheese, of course. And if you want to learn, come here every Saturday and for sure I give new content about something different every week and next week we're going to speak uh, I don't remember um, I don't remember <laughs> but anyway don't I always have a new content every week okay so okay. and as I always says each is because Life without cheese is like love without a kiss. See you around and see you next week. Take care. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son. El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son. El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. Quesos colombianos y venezolanos, todo hecho en tu casa. Con sabor zuliano y calor humano. Los quesos en casa tienen vitaminas rápidos de hacer En cualquier cocina, tan fácil como pelar mandarinas Quesitos en casa, fácil